what is the one thing that unites most human beings today? No, we're not looking for spiritual answers. In these times of capitalism, what unites us is that all of us are consumers. Weren't expecting this kind of a positive spin on capitalism, were you? Capitalism creates gaps, but also builds bridges over them. When you think about it, it actually is kind of spiritual. Okay, before I get carried away, let's switch from the spiritual to the practical. As consumers, we have rights and a justice system to ensure that grievances are heard and compensations are made. So, in this episode, we are going to talk about the Consumer Protection Act 2019. Why it exists, who it is for, consumer rights, how and where to register complaints and some important features of this act. So many headings. Sounds like a textbook only, no? In fact, let's do this textbook style. I'll explain everything with bullet points and all. And unlike what we see in our usual textbooks, this stuff is actually useful to us in real life. We begin with a little bit of background on the Act. The Consumer Protection Act 2019 came into effect in August 2019 and replaces the Consumer Protection Act of 1986. The objective, as stated in the Act, is this. An Act to provide for protection of the interests of consumers and for the said purpose to establish authorities for timely and effective administration and settlement of consumers' disputes and for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto. Consumer issues are obviously different today from what they were in 1986, so it makes sense for this new Act to have come into place. But speaking of changing with the times, whoever drafts these things, please do something about the lengths of sentences in these documents. I mean, you're dealing with people whose attention span is only as long as five Instagram stories. Ah, Instagram got you all excited, huh? now enough social media, get back to the textbook. Now, if you're wondering what kind of textbook doesn't have definitions, you are absolutely justified. So. Please note some important definitions. We begin with consumer. This is a person who buys any good or avails a service for a fee but does not include a person who obtains a good for resale. The Act covers transactions done offline and online through electronic means, tele-shopping, multi-level marketing or direct selling. However, a person will not be considered a consumer if they purchase any goods or avail any service free of charge purchase a good or hire a service for a commercial purpose or avail any service under a contract of service. So don't get tempted by the free mug with the coffee powder because if it comes with a broken handle, you can't complain officially. Next up, goods. This refers to every kind of movable property other than actionable claims and money. It includes stock and shares, growing crops, grass and things attached to or forming part of the land. Defects in goods may be any fault, imperfection or shortcoming in the quality, quantity, potency, purity or standard of the goods. Examples include dents, leaks and tears. And it isn't just physical goods that are covered under the Act. Consumers have the right to complain against faulty services too. Services are something you pay money for but does not fall under the goods category. Examples include banking, transport, electricity supply and entertainment services, but does not include free services. So, if your chartered accountant cousin offers to do your taxes for free but makes a mistake, you'll be in trouble and you can't even sue them. But if you got a receipt from them, you could sue them for deficiency in service, which is any fault, imperfection, shortcoming or inadequacy in the quality, nature and manner of performance of a service. Defects are a kind of bad trade practice, but that's not the only way in which a goods or service provider can make mistakes. Any trade practice which adopts an unfair or deceptive method or practice in order to sell a good or service is an unfair trade practice. Some of these are when goods and services are not of the required standard, such as products beyond their expiry date, when second-hand goods are sold as new, when goods and services do not have the claimed use or benefit, for example, A New Delhi Consumer Forum asked cosmetic manufacturer Imami to pay a consumer 10,000 rupees after their fair and handsome cream failed to live up to its promise of fairer skin in three weeks. Imami was also fined 15 lakh rupees. When products or services do not have the claimed warranty or guarantee, such as when products are not repaired despite being within the warranty period, when the price of a product or service is misleading, false and misleading advertisements for selling at a bargain price, 
offering gifts or prizes to lure customers with no intention of providing them, selling goods which do not fall within the safety standards set up by the competent authority, hoarding or destroying goods with the intention of raising the cost of these or similar goods manufactured in greater number so as to manipulate higher prices, manufacturing or offering spurious goods or adopting deceptive practices in the provision of services such as delivery of wrong product or money being debited from a bank account despite not using the ATM or otherwise spending money. All this means that warnings such as goods once sold will not be taken back or no exchange or even no refund under any circumstances amount to unfair trade practice and do not carry any legal weight. But then, nice to see, good to hold, if broken we consider it sold is fair enough, right? Because as consumers, we also need to have some responsibility. But since we prefer rights over responsibilities, let's look at the rights guarantee to consumers under the Act. Right to be protected against the marketing of goods, products or services which can be hazardous to life and property. Right to be informed about the quality, quantity, potency, purity, standard and price of goods, products and services. Right to be assured of access to goods, products and services at competitive prices. Right to be heard at appropriate forums. Right to seek redressal against unfair trade practices that are involved in the exploitation of customers. Right to consumer awareness. Where there are rights, there should be a way to file complaints if these rights are not upheld. And because we Indians have so much to complain about, the Act sets in place a redressal mechanism to accept and study these grievances and provide compensation where applicable. Before we get to the mechanism, let's understand when a complaint can be made. A complaint may be made in writing under the following circumstances. Loss or damage is caused to the consumer due to unfair trade practice of a trader or service provider. The article purchased by a consumer is defective. The services availed of by a consumer have some deficiency. A trade or service provider has overcharged for some goods or services. Hazardous goods or services are being offered for sale to the public. Complaints can be filed by a consumer, a voluntary consumer association, the central government or any state government, one or more consumers where there are numerous consumers having the same interest, or in case of death of a consumer, their legal heir or representative. The Act makes the provision for the setting up of the Central Consumer Protection Authority to promote, protect and enforce the rights of consumers. The CCPA will regulate matters related to violation of consumer rights, unfair trade practices and misleading advertisements. It will carry out the following functions. Inquiring into violations of consumer rights, investigating and launching prosecution at the appropriate forum, Passing orders to recall goods or withdraw services that are hazardous, reimbursement of the price paid and discontinuation of the unfair trade practices as defined in the Act. Issuing directions to the concerned trader, manufacturer, endorser, advertiser or publisher to either discontinue a false or misleading advertisement or modify it. Imposing penalties. Issuing safety notices to consumers against unsafe goods and services. While going through the websites of these bodies, you may encounter a term like product liability. What it means is that product manufacturers, service providers or sellers are liable to compensate a consumer for any harm or injury caused by a defective good or deficient service. To claim compensation, a consumer has to prove any one of the conditions for defect or deficiency as given in the Act. Since we are speaking of deficiencies and defects, many of you may be thinking about online shopping. The discrepancy between what we see on shopping sites and what we actually receive has spawned a legion of memes. Obviously, the 1986 Act wouldn't have covered such transactions, but the 2019 Act does. As per the new Act, all the laws that apply for direct selling would also be applicable to e-commerce. One of the key guidelines in this regard is that e-commerce platforms are required to disclose the details of the sellers. Apart from the manufacturers, product liability would also include sellers and service providers. Another thing that is particularly relevant to our times as opposed to the 1980s is the explosion of advertising and the involvement of celebrities in these advertisements. The Act lays down guidelines for any misleading advertisements for a product or service which affects the consumer. It could lead to a prison term of two years and a fine which can be up to 10 lakh rupees. Any subsequent offence could lead to an imprisonment of up to five years and a fine extending to 50 lakh rupees. 
The new act has provisions which allow the CCPA to fix the liability even on the endorser of any misleading advertisement. It can also prohibit an endorser from making endorsement for any product or service for a period of one year if found necessary. Subsequent violations could result in prohibition from endorsing any product or service for a period of three years. This is expected to make the brand ambassadors exercise due diligence on the veracity of the claims being made about a product or a service before choosing brands to endorse. Hmm, interesting. Can someone please break this news to the celebrities? Because if they know that they may be called out in public, we will hopefully see fewer of these supposed role models say that using a fairness cream leads to success or that instant noodles can be a healthy breakfast option. But all that aside, we'll do a final section on the differences between the 1986 and 2019 Acts, which will also act as a summary of today's lesson. Here we go. While there is no provision for a central regulator in the 1986 Act, the 2019 Act calls for the setting up of the CCPA. Until 2019, complaints in the Consumer Court had to be filed according to the jurisdiction under which the seller fell. But now, complaints can be filed from anywhere or from where the consumer resides. Now, courts can work towards settlement through mediation cells, which wasn't the case before. Earlier, the jurisdiction at the district level was complaints worth 20 lakh rupees, but now, District level authorities can accept complaints worth up to 1 crore rupees. The 1986 Act had nothing about product liability, but the 2019 Act allows consumers to seek compensation for harm caused. E commerce was not covered earlier but is considered as direct sales under the new Act. And finally, where there was no video conferencing option in the 1986 Act, the 2019 Act allows consumers to seek a hearing through video conference. And so, we have successfully completed the theory part of our chapter on the Consumer Protection Act 2019. What we'll do next is apply this practically, but not now, next week. Hope you have all enjoyed this little class. If you did, please like this video and share it with your friends and family, because there is no age limit for learning. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to Factly and hit the bell icon for updates.